Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Carl Siebrecht, co-founder and CEO of Flex, is today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast. Before becoming a serial entrepreneur, Carl was a diving officer in the U.S. Navy, which is a period he believes laid the foundation for his future. Prior to co-founding Flex in 2013, Carl was the president at Aquaniv and the president and CEO of AdReady. In addition to growing the on-demand warehousing, fulfillment, and logistics giant, Carl is also a chairman of Energy Savvy. Carl was recently named Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young. He's an avid supporter of Disability Rights Washington, Global Partnerships, and Duke & Gage. He's also a loving husband and father. Welcome, Carl. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm super glad to get to know you. Um, we're going to start with rapid fire. And so, given that you went to Duke, who's your favorite Duke basketball player of all time? Shane Battier. Okay. <laughs> My son will appreciate that. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Depends on the day. <laughs> How about today? <laughs> extrovert. Okay, yay. Bring it. Um, if there was a book written about your life, what would the title be? Balance. Nice. Do you have it or you want it? I have it. <laughs> oh, I like that. Very impressive. Um, what was the first concert that you ever attended? Van Halen, Houston, Texas. Sweet. That's where you're from, right? It is, yeah. Nice. Okay, a couple more. Um, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? I love to win. And what is a hidden talent that we would not know about you? I'm a musician. Oh. been in a couple rock bands in my past. Really? There may be a third act to come at some point. Really? We'll what do you play? Guitar, keyboards, vocals. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. That's And do you sing? I do. We might, we might, you do? Of course, but not here. <laughs> we might make you sing. <laughs> not going to happen. It's got to happen. Come on, Carl. So tell me. Okay, so you're from Houston, Texas. I've never been to Texas. I'm actually going to Austin um, soon, and I cannot wait. Tell me about Houston and your childhood. Yeah, so Houston's super big, super flat, super humid. You know, my experience was was really more about growing up in a suburb than growing up in Houston per se. Uh, my folks are from the Midwest. They're actually both from South Dakota. You don't hear that very often. Uh, and so I managed to to spend my entire childhood in Houston and not come away with an accent, which sometimes mm -hmm. yeah, you don't makes sound me like sad. It. Uh, cause it's a pretty cool accent. Do you but, say y'all? Uh, when, when it suits me. <laughs> After a couple uh, beers? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Houston was great. Um, but, uh, it was all I knew at the time. And, and like I said, sort of looking back, it could have been a suburb of any, of any big city in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into this, but you went on to go to great college and, and get an MBA and was education kind of a big value in your house? Yeah. Education was a big value. You know, I'd say it was... It was kind of work hard, and people aren't going to give you anything. You got to earn it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, don't ever get too impressed with yourself. Um, Stay but work humble. hard, yeah. yeah. And so, where did that discipline come from? And like, what were you fueled by when you were a kid? You know, as a kid, I uh, my dad was always like the hardest working guy. You know, he mm -hmm. was always the first one into the office. Um, uh, he took a lot of pride in that and I just sort of watched it. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that that had an impact on me. Um, my mom was, uh, uh, also worked very hard. She was a music teacher. Um, and she just was this very balanced, uh, person uh, who I think, um, the two of them, you know, they came from, uh, backgrounds where, again, you had to work hard to, to earn, uh, you know, earn the right to sort of go on and do the next thing. And, and and never made a huge deal out of people succeeding uh, at one thing or another. It was more just like, oh, great, that's really fantastic. We're proud of you. Kind of what's kind of next? On to the next, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you go to private school or public school for high school? Public school. Yeah. And so, was it one of those things where you were like the smart musical 
nerdy kid or were you like the cool athlete musical kid? I'm hearing the music it, thing. It was kind of funny. I mean, I think that uh, I sort of got along with everybody. Yeah. I got along with the jocks, the nerds, the music guys, music kids, uh, and it was a little bit of each of those. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of the things, you know, looking back, that maybe it was a little bit different. And yeah. I, I think that actually, uh, you know, carries forward today. I can get along with uh, all types of people. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've learned as uh, as I've gotten older and throughout the course of my career is um, it, it has helped me understand how to surround myself with different types of people and really appreciate different perspectives. Yeah. Like your EQ is just as important as your IQ, which was obviously high because you went on to Duke. Was that kind of your dream school or did how did you learn about Duke? Yeah, it's funny. Um I have my oldest daughter is now going. She's a senior in high school, so she's right in the middle of this process. Oh, it's hell, and, right? And so you, you can't help but compare to, uh, you know, my, you know, your own experience and what was that like. And and mine was funny. You know, I grew up in Houston, went to a, a good public school. Um, there's a lot of great colleges and universities in Texas. I mean, a lot. Yeah. I just had this kind of wanderlust. I don't know, this desire to go out of state. Um, we didn't travel a whole lot. Uh, when I was a kid, we'd go mm -hmm. to uh, national parks and such. But I hadn't seen much of the country and been to many other cities. And uh, I had some friends. Uh, my closest friends were also kind of achievement-oriented and sort of had this desire to go see the world a mm -hmm. little bit, see what else is out there. And so I just got it in my head that, you know what, I'm going to go to school someplace not in Texas. Yeah. And so I started looking around, you know. I mean, do you go mailing, visit? Mailing away for catalogs. Yeah, old school. Uh, old school, right? And, uh, you know, I wanted to go to some a school that I thought was a good school. Um, and then I loved college basketball. Oh, yeah. So Duke, you're like, go big or go home, it, Yeah. Right? So you're like, okay, I want to go to a good school that has a good college basketball program. Yeah. And uh, you Were know, you like the kid that... with the painted face at the games? And... Uh, <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> But yes, yeah, so, so Duke popped up, right? Yeah, you know, it's a good school. You know, the basketball program was really just up and coming at that point. And, uh, you know, mailed away for the catalog, looked great, applied, got in, never been there. Oh, you just showed up. Just showed up. Sight unseen yeah, because of the basketball. The, well, well, you know, and there was like the Academics, chapel looks really yeah. cool on the front of the uh, catalog. And then the <laughs> academics were good. So it was like, what, you know, what could be better? Yeah. So. And was it everything that you expected and kind of what surprised you? Absolutely. It was, it was just amazing experience. And, you know, the, the other wrinkle in that plan was, you know, Duke and these other schools are very expensive. So the other, the other thing was, okay, we're going to figure out how to pay for school. Yeah. And you look around and I wasn't going to get a basketball scholarship uh, or a music scholarship. So yeah. uh, ROTC. Yeah. Hey, ROTC, you know, wow, you, they'll pay for your school and give you a monthly stipend. This is amazing. And then you serve four years uh, yeah. to pay them back. And and you did the you did the diving program, right? I did. Yeah. And how what was that application process like? What do you have to do to get in? So so uh, when you're in ROTC, um, uh, you learn, you take classes and every summer you go on training uh, and kind of orientation types of uh, uh, trips and you, you basically serve for, you know, six to eight weeks each summer and it gives you exposure to, in the Navy, different branches of the Navy, right? So you learn what it's like to be on a surface ship, you learn what submarines are all about, uh, you learn what it's like to fly, you know, be a Navy pilot like Tom Cruise. That's um, incredible. Marine Corps. There's a lot of things you can do in the Navy and so uh, you know, when you're a senior, you have to figure it out. So you're going to serve at least four years uh, to pay back your... You know, after college. After college to serve um, your commitment. And so you got to figure out what do you want to do. And you look at all these different options and, you know, pros and cons. And, and uh, a good friend of mine and I found this diving program, which just sounded super cool. You know, it was, uh, it was very competitive to get into it, uh, there were physical requirements, uh, which were, you know, fun and challenging. Like what? You know, the application process to get in was, you know, what's your academic transcript? What's your, um, uh, how, uh, I don't know, what, what's your rating as a, uh, you know, it's called a midshipman, you know, like mm. all the military types of things you do in school, you know, were you, were you good at that? Were you not good? Did you take it seriously or not? Uh, and then there's a, there's a actual physical test, right. uh, which was, 
sort of swimming, running, and treading and water, pull ups and push ups and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, frankly made the intrigue of of going there pretty cool, right? Oh, it's like, course. oh wow, I'm gonna have to yeah. do really well on this and it's this elite thing and if I get in, you know, I've achieved something. And uh so that was kind of intriguing uh, in and of itself. But then the actual job sounded pretty cool too. Like, you know, your job would be to uh dive, you know, or or lead a team of Did, divers. So you had no claustrophobia. I tried once to get I, certified and I was like freaked out in the pool. Uh, yeah, I was like, no, ah, I, didn't. I didn't like I this. didn't. But I had never I had never uh ever done any diving before That's incredible. applying to this thing. And uh you know, you get in, which is super cool, and then uh and then you go to dive school, which is really hard and um uh you know, it tests you in a lot of ways, and yeah. and if you get through that, you feel not only good uh, from a sense of achievement, but you, um, you know, you really develop pretty incredible relationships with people when you go through that. And, yeah, and, and where are those people now? Are you still in touch with a lot of them? Uh, a handful, but not a yeah. lot. What does that generally kind of condition you to become? Because I know that you've referenced to things that I've read that that kind of helped shape you as a leader. Yeah. So where did people apply that in general? Well... It was a pretty rigorous uh, thing. Um, it, you know, I, I think one of the results is you can, it has helped me become a little bit, uh, uh, I'd just say, like, unflappable. I, I think I would, that's a bit of my DNA anyway. It sounds I mean, like people, it. You know, even when I was a kid, they were kind of like, you know, nothing riles, you know. Like yeah. Nothing seems to rile me up too much. Uh, so I think it's part of who I am. But but when you go through an experience like that, and and it's not look, it's not just Navy diving, but it it other careers in the military and other careers where people, uh, people's safety and uh, yeah, you're and, and your level limits, of responsibility for, sure. for others is 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 big. You know, the, those uh, moments and those experiences put a lot of other thing in perspective. So if someone yeah. says, "Wow, how hard is it to start a company?" I'm like, "It's really, really hard." But nothing compared. You to, know, like yeah. it's probably not as hard as being the person on call in the ER. Right. You know, so it like gives the you some level perspective. of stress and yeah, it gives you perspective. Yeah. It sounds like you're pretty confident going in. You're like, "Hey, I've never been to this school. I'm just going to show up." Or, "Hey, I've never <laughs> done any diving, and I'm going to apply." Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, I think that's fair, but. Uh, to me, it just felt like something that would be normal to do. Like go out and try, go out and try new things, and yeah. you know you'll discover some that you really like and take to, and you'll probably discover some others that you don't. Yeah. You know, I think one it, one of the things uh, I think my mom actually said this uh, at some point. She says, "You know, uh, don't compare yourself to others because it'll either make you jealous or conceited." <laughs> Isn't that like, That's like so isn't that simple. brilliant? It's so brilliant. And, you know, I still think about it. Is your that. mom still alive? Yeah, she is. We need to like credit her for that. Yeah. What's her name? Judy. <laughs> Go Judy. Yeah. We love Judy. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually really important and kids need to get reminded of that. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Um and so did you go right on to get an MBA or you went and worked first and then went back? So I spent four years in the Navy. Yeah. Um tremendous experience. Uh you know, wouldn't trade it. it, it I and where were you living at that time? Uh, it was really terrible. So here's a funny story. Yeah. Uh, you know, Army has ROTC scholarships too, as does Air Force. And, uh, you know, each branch of the military is great, right? But when I looked at, should I should I go for the Army scholarship? Because you apply, you know, to both, increase your odds. Should I go for the Army scholarship or the Navy one? And And I thought, well... Huh? Where where are the bases for each of these? And you look at the army, they're like Smart. Georgia, yeah. Kentucky, Fort Hood, Texas. Yeah. And where are the Navy bases? Oh, Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah, Hawaii. Live there. Florida. Live there. San Diego. Live there. So yeah, it's pretty good. Well, water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, so yeah, uh, when I decided that uh, I would leave the Navy after my four year commitment, um, I thought, hey, should I go get a job? Should I go to or straight to school? Uh, and I chose the latter yeah. to go get my MBA right away. And did you feel that that was a necessity? And do people ask you now or talk to you about how necessary is it to have an MBA today? Yeah, it's a hard question because I think things are very different. I think they're different today, but they're also different for different people. So, mm -hmm. you know, I studied economics and Russian in, at Duke. And, uh, you know, so when you study economics, you learn a little 
bit about business. I have a friend who studied Russian at Duke. That That's right? so random. That Jake is... Anderson. Yes. Mm, I mean, he's we'll much to... younger than both of us. Okay. But All right. Yeah, I always thought it's it was... a great program there. It still is, I hear. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you speak Russian? Yet. <laughs> Are you Russian? No. What's Siebrecht? Uh, it's German oh, in German. heritage, yeah. Huh. What made you intrigued to study Russian? Uh, just because you needed a language requirement, and I thought Spanish was boring, and you look down the list, and you're like, oh, Russian looks interesting. So mm. uh, I took, you know, I don't remember what the requirement was, but a year or two, uh, but the, the department was phenomenal. The yeah. teachers were phenomenal. You know, it was, again, I kind of, I just, this just occurred to me, so maybe there's a pattern or not, but it, it was also kind of similar to Navy diving. It's the small department. It's this small team. Yeah. Sounds like you of, like connectedness. Of, of people that really kind of go deep and care. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, just kept taking Russian classes because I loved it. And then Have you been to Russia? Up, I have. I have not. Uh, I actually went to, I'm dating myself, but I went to Russia when it was still the Soviet Union. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sure. So did my dad, and he's told me crazy stories. Yeah. Wow. And so, okay, so you went back to get your MBA. A lot of people say that, obviously, it's a great education. It could be used as a kind of break when you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. Mm-hmm. It could be great for building a network. Um, what did you get out of it? Yeah. So for me, it was it was really no-brainer. I thought so going in, and then while I was there and afterwards, it was just it was super clear. So again, for perspective, you know, I had studied economics in undergrad, and you learned some businessy kind of stuff. Uh but then in the Navy, I learned a whole lot of things, but I didn't learn anything about um, how to read a PL. Yeah, and, yeah, none of that. I had never even used a spreadsheet. Yeah, marketing, all of it. So when I show up, you know, at, at talk, uh, Dartmouth to go get an MBA, like everything was new to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, my classmates, a lot of them came from investment banking of and course. consulting. And for them, it was like, yeah, it's like yeah, first you go to Goldman and then you go to Dartmouth or you go to Bain. Yeah. And then go, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So for me, it was all new. Um, so there's just a ton of value to get exposed to all that stuff in an mm-hmm. intensive way. And then the other thing, which I, uh, w- which also was one of the factors leading to me deciding to go straight to, to business school was, you know, you start school in September, the, the year first year starts, right? Uh, by October, the recruiting process for summer interns starts. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so within like 30 or 45 days, I was in a cohort of people interviewing for Bain, McKinsey, all these investment banks, where had I not gone to business school, there was no way I would have even gotten a call back from any of those same people. Mm-hmm. You just can't like cold call in and say, hey, I'd like to interview. Yeah. But it puts you in that cohort. Yes. And so immediately you're in the stream of like getting exposure to all these great companies and and what, what also, what a great foundation. Well, first of all, we brought you to Seattle. How'd you end up here in Seattle? Yeah, so, so from uh, business school, I did go to Bain. Yeah. Uh, again, it was like... Did you like it? Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Again, I loved it. It was... Um, uh, I worked in this small team. Wow, well, there is a pattern. Uh, that was uh, this private equity practice that they were just starting to build. The Bain Capital? Even, uh, no, it was, a, it was on the consulting side. On the consulting so side. So the consulting side would basically... Uh, hire out case teams to help the um, the investing side, the capital side, do their due diligence and, you know, SWAT teams to kind of come in and help them figure out, like, what they should pay for Super XYZ. Cool. So what was what was also was kind of my first exposure to entrepreneurialism is the, the, the consulting partners who were, le- you know, selling these case teams across the hall to the capital side were like, hey, I wonder if the other private equity firms in the world would also want to buy these services. And the answer was yes, big time. So they put a name on it. Hey, this is the Bain's private equity practice. And it was the fastest growing practice area in Bain for maybe like decades. How long did, that's super cool. How long did you stay there? I stayed there for three years. It was pretty yeah. intense. It was kind of like... Was it one of those like sleep under your desk type much. of jobs? Yeah. And had you met your wife at this point? I had, yeah. We we actually met an undergrad. Oh. And there's a tie-in to Duke. the, uh, to the uh, being in the band oh. story, too. Because, oh. right, you know, the musicians. Tell me. That's like, this is the good stuff. <laughs> it's just that, you know, when you're in, in a rock band, right, in college. Did you have long and, hair? No. I was in the <laughs> Navy. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
a Navy yeah. guy in the band, huh? Right? Weird. Cool. I think um, it's great. So, yeah. So we'd play all around campus at the, you know, fraternity parties, sorority parties and all that. Um, and so there was a connection there with uh, how I ended up meeting my wife. Uh, because uh, when we met, there, you know, there was this reference check that happens, right? She's like, I don't know, do, do, you know, with her friends, like, do we, do we, do we like this guy? What's he all about? And one of the friends says, he's the lead singer in that band. And she's like, oh, okay. Done. Right? So it, it, it's like a door opener. My husband has been telling my son, like, learn how to play the guitar because he plays yeah. guitar. Yeah. And he lost interest. And he's like, no, no, no. Trust me. Learn to play the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Women love yeah. it. Yeah. 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 It's a deal opener and closer. Yeah. 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 So, wow. So you met at Duke and then she went with you all these places. Yeah. Well, she had her own, uh, very much her own path. She's... Uh, um, went to NYU law school and like top of her class, clerked with the judge, all this sort of stuff. Power she's couple. The, well, she's the, she's the real power. Um, anyway, uh, but we, um, look, we met, uh, she was 18 and as a freshman, I was a junior. Oh my um, goodness. So yeah, we go way back. Yeah. She went to grad school at the same time I did. And then we, we settled initially in Boston. Yeah few years of Bain. And then, so what brought you to Seattle? So, yeah. uh, I'm glad you're bringing it back because yeah. I'm all over the place usually. Well, Welcome so here's to my the world. thing. Uh, um, very, very close friend of mine uh, who I met uh, at the Navy ROTC orientation the week before freshman year at Duke uh, is a guy called Mike Algon, who's one of the founders of Aquanav. And so we went to Duke together. We went through the Navy diving program together. Um, he went to business school a year after I went to business school. Uh, he came out to Seattle after HBS and started this company, Aquantive. It was Avenue A at the time. And I was at Bain and he would, uh, reach out every few months and say, oh, you should come to Seattle. Yeah. And, uh. And you're like, where? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I, Northwest sounded great to me. Are you outdoorsy guy? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So Northwest sounded great. It was the whole internet advertising thing that I was skeptical of mm. uh, in 1998. Um, so anyway, that's what brought us out was, you know, let's give this a go. Uh, and so now we're 20 years into our two to four year plan. Of course. To be in it's Seattle. always a two to four year plan. And so, okay, so you had kind of the big companies. You got the Bain, Aquanav, and then I know you went on, obviously, Microsoft. How did those companies compare as far as corporate culture and yeah, so the Avenue A, uh, a Quantive is the name it, it came, it, we changed it to over time. That journey was, uh, you know, had a bunch of different chapters. When I started there, it was after their Series B, um, but they were growing at this insane rate. Mm -hmm. um, and just a few months after I arrived, we went public. This was before the first bubble burst. Mm -hmm. And so we had grown to many, many, many hundreds of people. The bubble burst um, and... Uh, half of our clients went out of business. Uh, so that company had to transform itself rapidly um, and really sort of figure out, was there a real core business inside there? Good news was the answer was absolutely yes, you know, and sort of shed everything else and focus as much as possible on the bits that were real and mm -hmm. valuable. Were what really... were those bits and what was your role? Yeah, so so the main bits were, um, you know, this company did... Um, uh, marketing and, and mostly on the media side for digital marketing. And so the real bits were uh, we had real customers, not just dot coms who had raised VC and had to sort of get traffic to their website uh, uh, and maybe arguably overpay for that. But we had real mature, profitable enterprise companies who had done enough of this to realize that it was a positive ROI um, tool in their toolkit to sort of you know, find traffic, find targeted traffic on the on uh, the internet, and drive it to their website to convert sales. So companies like Eddie Bauer, uh, AT and T Wireless uh, was a big one at the time. You know, driving subscribers to sign up for their service. Uh, Microsoft and a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. So what the the real bits were, you know, the companies who were mature and real and were the the right ones to validate if this service is actually useful. Sure. Uh, and then the uh, on the tech side, it was the parts of the functionality that delivered that value. So my role, uh, when I started, I, I uh, ran the first product team 
there. And then as, as the company grew, my role with the company continued to grow. Cool. I like that. And had you had any experience running product? I mean, nope. just out of the blue, you're like, I'm a product nope. guy now. In fact. Is this just because your friend trusted you and you were a deep dive, no no pun intended, yeah. but the type to really get your hands dirty and I learn? think that was part of it. You know, when I, when I accepted the job, so I came out to Seattle after he'd cajoled me enough. Um, of course, the weekend I, you know, it was like, hey, just, just talk to people on Friday and then stay the weekend and then, you know. If nothing else, we'll have had a fun weekend together. Well, it turns out it was one of those perfect of June weekends. I was going to say, hopefully I mean, it was August. Per- yeah, this was June. So it, was oh, a little, it could have been a little dodgy, score. but it was yeah. perfect. You know, I spent an entire day meeting people and they were not only bright, but like full of energy and the passion and the, it was just so palpable. Uh, and then, you know, half the company was training to hike Rainier. Hmm. You know, so like, we these went are my on a people. training hike, oh, yeah. and you're just like, okay, this was just not, yeah. not even fair. And, you know, my wife, who also knows Mike, because we all went to school together, yeah. before I left, she said, I said, oh, you know, I'm just going to go check it out. And she's like, you're going to come back and want to move to Seattle. I said, oh, no, I'm not. And uh, so I had to buy a little um, Space Needle snow globe in the airport as my... <laughs> As my as your gift, as my gift Welcome. to say, it turns Welcome, out you honey. were right. Yeah, like let's move to Seattle. Yeah, and so um, after all these kind of big company experiences, um, how long were you at Microsoft? I've had a lot of Microsoft alums on here, and it's interesting to hear. Yep. Uh, so take. Microsoft bought Aquanid yeah. in 2007, and I was there for about two years total. And was that part of the acquisition? Like, mm-hmm. hey, should stay? Was there any part of you that wanted to stay longer? You know, going in, um, I really wanted to stay. It was this amazing thing where uh, we competed at the time with this company called DoubleClick. Google had bought DoubleClick. And you know, five weeks later, Microsoft buys Aquaniv, and you know it was like it's going to be it's the like same battle. Yeah, but now it's going to be the I don't know what to, the, the, the big, magnitude, the, the yeah. big action figures. Yeah. you know, and that was such a motivating and and thrilling thing. Um, it, you know, after spending some time there, it was just it. What I learned is it's hard to operate at that scale. It's different. Mm-hmm. It's I found it that. You know, what I realized is I actually wasn't great at getting stuff done. In the big. At that scale. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, it felt like, hey, this is, it, you know, it's something that can be learned. Um, but, it, you you know, it's not like just because you were successful at this other thing, you can walk in and be successful mm-hmm. there. I've never worked um, for a big company. I don't know that I would, A, enjoy it or B, be successful. Yeah. It, it does it was, seem like a whole different skill set. It was different. It was yeah. different. And, you know, there were elements that are just super cool to be able to understand the magnitude of the impact you could have and the, and the scale of the, the number of people you served. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was a fabulous learning experience. It was a great experience overall, but ultimately, you know, I started to miss the, the kind of thrill of being able to build. Yeah. Stuff be on the front have, lines and just have an impact. Know yeah. that if you do, if you work hard and put hours in and lots of thought and deliberation into a thing you could see the see the results outcome and um it's just a harder thing to do in a big organization yeah. and so you left to start ad ready is that right i left to join ad ready oh you didn't start ad ready to join it okay yeah. so where was it when you joined and they wh- were three to four years in oh, okay uh, and had just raised i think three years in and had just raised their series b got it it sounds like that series b like that was kind of your sweet spot of where you found comfort. Tell me about that run. Well, it was interesting. So um, I think it was more coincidental that that was a Series B yeah. thing uh, and Avenue A was as well. Uh, but what I did find comforting, or at least to, to be a good f- potential fit there, was you know I had at that point run a big organization um, and uh, it was in the same domain. Yeah. Ad- advertising so you knew technology. your staff. Yeah. What was different was at Atlas, which was the division name that I ran at, at Aquaniv, uh, we served enterprise customers, mm-hmm. like big customers and big agencies. And at AdReady, the, the the general sort of idea was to build something that was very Atlas-like, uh, but but build that and sell it for the mid-market. So smaller customers was generally you know, like a, a, a general way to sort of mm-hmm. compare the two. If you have to say, like, as a CEO, there's always kind of, this is my... Thing. Yeah. Were you yeah. big on driving product there? 
Not as much, actually. So um, one of the co-founders and uh, Aaron, who had been CEO prior to my coming on board, um, he was kind of had been that product lead yeah. um, and stayed in that role um, for a while, for the first I don't know, year or so uh, of my being there. Yeah. Interesting. And so what what ended up happening there and how did that come to be? Like, how did you end up getting that job and what drew you there? There was familiarity with the domain. Mm-hmm. Um you know, frankly, there was a desire to, to go be a CEO. Like, what's that going to be all about? Mm-hmm. Um, and it felt like a good size. It felt like uh, the company was at a stage where I believed I could help. Uh, I liked the team a lot uh, and the investors a lot. Um, so, it, so it just worked. It was a good fit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, didn't turn out the way everybody was hoping it would, you know, and, and that's a good reminder, you know. Yeah. What were uh, some of the lessons you learned from that? Yeah. You know, one lesson learned uh, was it's it's hard to build a solution for small customers that isn't super automated. It sounds like a super basic thing to say, but the, the company was trying to serve the mid-market of customers. But what we found was that just because customers were smaller didn't mean they ha- didn't have unique needs. And the combination of, of, of those things should just be a killer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, that was a lesson that was sort of learned or relearned. Um, and then probably the biggest, the biggest takeaway I had there was uh, uh, AdReady started out of the gates tremendously uh, uh, strong. So they grew incredibly fast early on. The, the founders uh, came from classmates mm-hmm. and hit on an idea and executed on it really, really well. And so... Uh, they were at the front lines of kind of a next generation of ad tech, um, which was this more uh, very highly automated um, ad marketplace, um, kind of bitted marketplace technology driven mm-hmm. thing that was just sort of starting to emerge. And they were literally one of the first companies to plug into these bitted uh, marketplaces. So it was su- that was super interesting to me because I had seen that start to develop from uh, Aquaniv and Microsoft. Um, but it was this, these small, nimble companies who were moving really, really fast. Mm-hmm. And AdRate is one of those. Um, you know, in retrospect, what we what we didn't figure out soon enough is that although they were the first company to plug into this new ecosystem, like the first one, uh, they plugged into kind of the V1 mm. set of capabilities. And within a year, year and a half, people were lapping them. They, the the people building that infrastructure had built V2. And V2 was sort of 10x more effective or 100x more effective than V1. Mm. But AdReady, and we had we had already built a business around V1. And so the, the prospect of kind of unplugging from V1 and replumbing it to V2. This is actually super interesting for people listening that are um, running engineering teams, yeah. running product teams, to be thinking about kind of future-proofing yeah. the business. It was. And it was this very poignant trade-off of, man, you know, if we're going to if we're going to kind of replumb this thing, we're going to have to sacrifice near-term revenue. Mm-hmm. Like we're and were the investors to... on board with that? Well, or like, what was your take on it at the time? Do you remember? I, <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Well, ultimately, we made the wrong decision. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, you know, 2020 hindsight, what we should have done is immediately recognize this and said, you know, like, we are like whatever risk there is to near-term revenue. We just have to take that it's risk. It's so hard, though, to know it's it so at the hard. time. Because you kind of convince yourself that, uh, you know, let's start working on V2. Once we capture all the y- You know, revenue. in parallel yeah. with everything else. And it's yeah. just, you know, we were a 50-person organization, and you just can't, you, you can't have sort of two big priorities. Mm-hmm. And when did you realize, hey, this thing's not going to go? Um, it probably was... I mean, about a year and a half into it, mm-hmm. uh, maybe maybe about a year into it, it sort of started to become really clear that this is going to look. This is actually going to start to look more like a turnaround than mm. a hey, you know, going in it was like growth has been phenomenal, and now it's starting to slow a little bit. Mm-hmm. But that's natural for a company that hits fifty people. It's like you need a new level of. Uh, scale and appreciation for process and coordination like it's it's just one of the phases of mm-hmm. building a company and so you know maybe a new leader could be part of the solution and did you feel that you were the right maybe like hey I'm not the right person to do this turn around well well no I felt 
I don't think anybody thought it was a turnaround when I started. Yeah. I certainly didn't. Um, it was more like, hey, growth was phenomenal. Now it's still good, but not as great. Like, let's get in there and, and build for the future. And, yeah. and, you know, about a year into it, started to feel like, you know, uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, this isn't going the way we thought it was yeah. going to go. And, and, it, and in some ways, it kind of sneaks up on you. Yeah. And that's why I say, like, hindsight 2020, I don't know if it would have been possible, but to pick up on those indicators earlier and make hard decisions. What did you learn that you could say that you're yeah. applying now? Yeah. The, um, I, I think one of the things I learned is that, you know, an appreciation for gray area it's it's rare that, um, maybe not super rare, but I'll, I'll call it, it's fairly common that there is no black or white clear answer, particularly when you're operating in such an environment of uncertainty. Like you're building a company, and particularly if that company is not, you know, the third or fourth or eighth player to build a version of it in a category, but you're actually inventing a category. Right, you're innovating, yeah. Like, you know... By definition, inherently, there's just a lot of uncertainty. So when you're faced with decisions, I think it's important to have an appreciation for the fact that we're not going to get precision here. Like, yes, we should do the math as best we can. Um, we should do analysis. We should, of course, talk to customers, as many of them as we can, understand what they say, what they feel. But mm -hmm. in a world where, you, you know, you're inventing something, customers aren't necessarily able to tell you exactly, you know, what what they want because you're building something that kind of solves a different problem right. or, or a problem in a different way. Right. So, so that's the first lesson. It's like just there is ambiguity. You have to understand that and appreciate it and then figure out, okay, how do we deal with ambiguity, right? Mm -hmm. So then how do you deal with ambiguity? Uh, you know, having frameworks for making decisions, um, having uh, our CTO, Dave Glick, uh, tenants, He's he's uh, been with us about six months. You're talking about Flex CTO, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's fantastic. And one of the things that he's brought over, he spent 20 years at Amazon, and he's he's just maniacal about. We have to have tenants, you know, which is just a way to say, like, what are the criteria on which we're going to make decisions? So I think that's crucial. In, in in whether that's in the framework form, because it it helps to clarify, mm -hmm. not only to the group or the person that's making the decision, but to the broader group around the full team. It's mm -hmm. like, here's, we we are making, or, or, you know, Sally is accountable for making this decision. And um, here is how she has thought about it and why she came out, you know, with, On the other end with, with this. B yeah. instead of A. Yeah. And, and yes, there's ambiguity and it wasn't a no-brainer that it should have been B. But here, remember, we adopted this framework of these tenets for how we're going to make decisions. Yeah. We used that. And here's the answer we came out. I completely agree. And so uh, you've learned a lot about different industries because you had, obviously, the ad tech. You kind of became a deep knowledge expert in that area. And then um, what was your role within Energy Savvy? So that was um, uh, when I was on a short leave of absence uh, in Microsoft, a, a very close friend of mine, Aaron Goldfeder, uh, was considering uh, leaving his job at where he'd been very successful at Microsoft. Uh, and starting a company. Mm -hmm. And so uh, early on, I was kind of a sounding board for him. You know, hey, here's what I'm thinking about, you know. And then he made the decision, yeah, I am going to go start a company. And so then I became a sounding board for different ideas that he had. And I'm super happy to do this. Um, it was kind of my entrepreneurial fix when I was working in a bigger company at the yeah. time. Uh, and plus Aaron's just a phenomenal guy. So always an excuse to hang out with him. Yeah, Aaron, uh, and, I know Aaron. And, He's and great. very, very bright. So... Uh, that turned into, you know, the idea that he liked the best was energy savvy, uh, asked if I could help in some way. And, and sold, and so I was which on is the board exciting. And... So let's get to Flex, because Flex is a super cool company and a little bit, not all those companies that you're like, oh, I should have thought of that. But it's such a brilliant, brilliant idea. Why don't you tell our listeners what Flex is for those who don't know? So Flex is a company. So we're in the warehousing and fulfillment business. So what that means is we help companies uh, move their goods around. Um, you think of uh, warehousing as a component of logistics. And logistics, the way I like to think of it, just quite simply, it's moving stuff from origin to destination. So it's ships, planes, trucks, and then warehouses are the nodes uh, 
that connect all the different transportation arcs. So, you know, being a, a sort of person who's maybe spent too much time in technology, everything sort of seems like technology. So if you think of a data network as uh, nodes and arcs, um, that's the same way to think about a logistics network is nodes, which are the warehouses, mm -hmm. um, could be routers, right? Uh, and arcs, which are transportation lanes, uh, that's, a, that's the way we think about logistics. So Flex is in the business of providing warehousing services. We will receive your goods. Um, we will take them off of pallets, put them into packages, and, and ship them out uh, either to consumers' doorsteps, so e-commerce fulfillment, or to a retail store to put it on a store shelf, kind of old school retail, right, brick and mortar, um, or just to send it to the next warehouse on mm -hmm. down your supply chain. So, And so what's the business model exactly? How does Flex make money, and is it your idea? Uh, not my idea. It's a brilliant idea. Um, so it came from a friend of a friend. We just talked about Aaron Goldfeder, one yeah. of Aaron's friends. Uh, I met at a party at Aaron's place, actually, and he came up and said, just out of the blue, he's like, you're a tech guy, right? I got an idea for you. And he just laid it out. So this guy, Drew, <laughs> Drew Vagarwal, is a phenomenal entrepreneur, uh, also based in Seattle. He had a little business doing um, home barware. Actually, not so little, but like martini glasses mm -hmm. and bottle openers and everything in that category. He was probably 10 years into this business. And he was on his third or fourth warehouse because he would import product from Asia, come through the port of Seattle. He had a warehouse in Kent. But then he was distributing product, you know, across the country to wine shops, gift shops, had a little uh, website, reselling.com, you know, direct to consumer. And he said, look, I have to lease these warehouses to handle my goods uh, on typically like a three-year term. And to understand how much space I need, I have to have some forecast. Well, it's a joke to try and forecast my business. Of course. How many I'm, martini glasses am I going to sell? Yeah, well, and he's, or need? He's, he's growing very rapidly. Yes. Like, am I going to win the Whole Foods account? Because if I win that, I'm going to need a lot more space. And I can't necessarily do it for three years. Right. Or, and yeah. I'm seasonal. So I, I sell a lot more product, move a lot more product in Q4 for holidays. And so he said, so I've always got, I, I lease these buildings. And I'm always long or short on space, always. And all my buddies who have businesses, we're all in the same boat. Like, couldn't, like, somebody should build a technology business awesome. so, you know, I can handle someone else's goods when I've got capacity and vice versa. And, <clears throat> you know, I came from ad tech where we built two-sided marketplace, marketplace businesses yeah. connected by software. And so as soon as he said that... You know, it's like getting hit in the face yeah, with ding, a hammer. Ding, ding. It's like, well, that's obvious. There's got to be 20 companies that have already done this. No one had. Um, and uh, so then you're sort of skeptical. Like, oh, what, what, why not? Like, what's the intractable problem? Is it legal? Is it liability? Is it an insurance thing? You know, what is it? And, and so we did a lot of diligence, talked to everybody we could find, said, hey, you know, played naive, which was super easy to do because... You're like, well, we, here's this idea. What do you think? And and made a long list of all the reasons, you know, people had. Or like, well, you'd have to think about this. You'd have to think about liability. You'd have to think about how would you standardize operations, all this stuff. And and we looked at that list and said, it feels like these are hard problems, but not unsolvable problems. And we went back to Druv and said, hey, uh, if we built this, would you buy it? And uh, he said, 100% yes. We incorporated and like six weeks later, we were generating revenue. Uh, he was our first customer, wow. which is like the, the perfect way to build a business, right? Oh, um, yeah. There's someone that has real pain. Yes. You're solving uh, it. My two co-founders are both software engineers, like amazing startup. So tell me about the co-founders. Co yep. So Francis Duong and Edmund Yu. And mm. so another connection. So uh, Francis was the first engineer uh, to work at Energy Savvy. Mm. He had left Microsoft and uh, he took a contract. Uh, position, but not a full time because he wanted to start his own company. So I got to know Francis a little bit through Aaron and Energy Energy Savvy, and uh, and then he and Ed went on to to create a company as part of the Y Combinator mm. uh, incubator down in the Bay Area. Yes. Um, so they that was their first startup experience. And anyway, years later, uh, they had sold that company. Uh, we had sold Ad Ready, and it just so happened that when I was ready to think about something new. Aaron Goldfeder is like, you know, dude, if you're going to start a company, you got to like... call Francis. And I was like, you know, you're right. Nice. And so you said you had revenue right away. And that was what year? 2013. Yeah. So we started the same year. Nice. What month? I'm August. August. Oh, we're August. 
I don't know. We have a discrepancy around what date. Is uh, it the date that I set up the LLC? Is it the date that I quit my old job? Is it the date uh, we yeah, got the office it's space? Area. It's sometime in August. Yeah. That's all I know. Um, but yeah, we met you guys right at the very, very beginning. Mm-hmm. It was like maybe just the three of you and found you guys some engineers. Um, and so where are you now? Because that was 2013. How many employees do you have now? And how much have you raised? And what's that experience been like? Yeah, so we're now 130 people. Um, we uh, completed our Series B in May. We raised $43 million from uh, Tiger Global and Activate Capital and Madrona as well. Um, Red Point down in the Valley led our Series A. So uh, just have a fantastic uh, group of investors. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that easy? Because you were like, hey, this is kind of a no-brainer business. And um, I wouldn't say, you know, it's never easy, right? Um, but it sounds like you've got a lot of really we, impressive names. We um, feel very fortunate. The process was was uh, very efficient and good uh, in both of our rounds, including our seed round too, by the way, um, which was led by Fritz Landman and Hank Vihill, uh here, uh, um, originally based in Seattle. Um, so we've had uh, good experience in fundraising. It's never easy. It's exhausting, mm-hmm. right? It's it's hard to, uh, y- you know, there's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes a lot of time too. It takes a lot of time, and you're time, like, I want to be you building. Tell, you know, and, and look, I I couldn't be any more passionate or excited about what we're building at Flex. Like, I just feel like this is the best job in the world. I feel like this company, you know. In our first few months, it became super clear to me that this is absolutely inevitable that this business is going to exist and it's going to be huge. Mm-hmm. The question is, you know, whether Flex would execute well enough to be the leader or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so incredibly passionate about like where this business is going and, and you know, what our mission is. And, and it's just sort of no brainer. The world will absolutely work this way. Um, that's good. So when you're out, you know, trying to convince investors to write big checks, you know, you got to have strong conviction and belief. But it's also exhausting to yeah, sort of telling the same story, you know, tell the same story over and yes. over again, particularly when you are so committed and have so much passion. Yeah. It just takes a lot of energy. So, Of course. And that's your introvert extrovert. Yeah. Hopefully you were extroverted that day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe well, you went home well, after and, and home. we're like and an you introvert. Recharge. Yeah. yeah, you got to recharge. And so how many um, warehouses are there today? Yeah, so our business model, so as I said, yeah. we're in this this kind of really basic, unsexy business, warehousing. It's pretty sexy because it's like but it is now. brilliant. Well, it is now because um, logistics, so trucks, trains, ships, warehouses, like history to date, uh, have been built to serve a retail model, a commerce model that hasn't changed for millennia. It was bring the goods to a place. It's going to be them. like the old market yeah. in, in, you know, like pick, you know, the cradle of civilization. Bring the goods to a place. The people go to that place and commerce happens, right? So that evolved to the corner drugstore, the strip mall, the shopping mall, the big box store, right? That continued to evolve in sort of different form factors. But fundamentally, it's bring the goods to a place. People go to the place. You buy. Everybody's happy. And so logistics was all about bringing the goods to the place, which was putting product on store shelves. And, you know, over the last many, many, many decades, companies like the big retailers and the big box guys in particular got really, really, really good at this. And they spend a ton of money doing it. So so one of the things in, in diligence when we start looking at this idea for Flex, you know, like, oh, how big is the market? You know, I worked at Bain, and they're like, that's yeah. one of the things Size, you should care Adjustable about. Like, market, yeah. How big is the market? You're like, $1.5 trillion is spent every year in the U.S. Trillion, trillion. with a T. It's over 8% of GDP. Yeah. You're like, I'll just take 1% of that. Yeah. So it's massive. and uh, and But it was all designed to put product on store shelves, all of it, and optimized it over decades. Like, it, like Procter & Gamble is super, super good at building their products, moving it to the Walmarts and Costcos of the world. And Walmart and Costco are really, really efficient at that because they're spending collectively one and a half trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. Like efficiency matters. I sure. think. But it's kind of has been the world's largest cost center. Like don't lose stuff. Don't break stuff. Be efficient. That's th- th- Those were the tenants. You know, that's what you optimized for in logistics. And then e-commerce comes along. 
and people want their stuff delivered to the house. And Yesterday. one company, yeah, and one company starts to, with, you know, with a clean sheet of paper, builds the logistics infrastructure optimized for that, which turns out is different than what you need to put product on store shelves. And they raise capital, convince investors, you know, rightly so, that they should be patient uh, uh, and, and go through the investment cycles to build scale, to build a company ultimately that could be, you know, that could be built, which they have. And they've trained all of us as consumers to, you know, like expect stuff to come like today or tomorrow and free. You know, that's just the way it should work. But they have spent tens and tens of billions of dollars building that infrastructure and nobody else, nobody else can afford to come close to that, particularly in terms of warehouses. One of the key things for e-commerce is you got to put the product close to the people. You want it there fast and cheap, don't ship it from, you yeah, know, across the Seattle to Tampa. Right. Right? It's just like basic physics, right? So what that means is you got to have lots of warehouses to put product close to where all the people live. Well, guess what? Warehouses are based on these leases. My friend Drew is like, man, I got to write a three to five year lease based on some forecast of volume. And it's expensive. I have to, it's like an office lease, right? That's committed capital when you sign that lease. It's one thing if you need one warehouse. It's an entirely different thing if you need 16 warehouses yes. to get to next day delivery. So that you can compete. So so you can't is basically yeah. the answer. No yeah. one else can replicate that scale. Well, that's where technology in a marketplace business comes in. Right? It's so brilliant. So we have we have 1,200 warehouses and we don't, we haven't signed a single lease because all these warehouses have extra capacity. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they signed five-year leases and they haven't been able to fill up their warehouses uh, you know, because some so are so. Who are your clients? I mean, yeah, who are so the... our customers? So we provide this service to uh, big enterprises from Walmart, mm -hmm. Procter and Gamble, Walgreens, others uh, to high growth startups like Casper Mattress, mm -hmm. Line Bikes customer, uh, Hims, and and so the difference, like what we're creating, I think there are a lot of metaphors for our business. The one that I think works best uh, to represent the value to our customers, the, you know, the, the retailers and merchants, is is AWS. It's what AWS invented uh, when the world, at the time, only offered data centers. So a data center is a fixed capital commitment. You you're gonna you're either gonna build it yourself or you're gonna outsource it to a third party who will lease space buy machines, hire people, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of fixed capital. And so you will sign a multi-year contract for a chunk of, of capacity is how data centers generally work, right? And then if you're going to scale, I remember this back in Avenue A, where our first data center was, was local because we were based in Seattle. It was nearby. It fueled our website and all our ad serving, you know, and you'd, you'd sign up for capacity and you're like, hey, there's latency, like there's ad latency on the East Coast. We need, a, we need an East Coast data center. You're like, okay, well, that's another big chunk of capacity. And then AWS comes along and they're like, hey, here's an idea. Plug in once to our capacity and then pay as you go. Mm -hmm. So they convert Pull out it. anytime you want. Yeah. So they converted all this fixed cost to pure variable cost. Yeah. And so now, what does that, what does that turn into? If, if you're a startup, you don't do a data center, right? Yeah. Is it Google Cloud? Is it Azure? Is it like... AWS, AWS invented the category, but now that category is a quarter of the entire IT infrastructure market. So think of it as like three quarters fixed, one quarter uh, flexible. flexible. Yeah. That's exactly where logistics is going. Flex has created the sort of AWS equivalent for warehousing and fulfillment so that you can have all these nodes without having any fixed capital commitment because you plug your shopping cart into Flex's API once, or if you're a big company, you have this like ERP system. And so you plug your, your order stream via EDI into Flex once. What is VD, via ED? EDI, Electronic Data Exchange. This oh, is another I protocol. Oh, I know this. Yeah, yeah. It's like- Or maybe not. Super old school API. Okay. It's like shorthand. So, but point is you plug in your order stream to Flex once and you can have a warehouse anywhere and pay as you go. And that means not not just that you can have two, eight, 10, 20 nodes, but your nodes can change. Because you know what? Depending on the company, you may have different needs in the winter than the summer. Of course. Right? You may want to put generators uh, and flashlights in the southeast if you're Ace Hardware for hurricane season. 
And you may want to put snow shovels and salt in the northeast for winter season, right? Yes. And you may want to uh, add lots of extra capacity if you're a big retailer like Walmart for Q4. And if you're, again, in a world where the infrastructure is fixed, th that is economically a bad match. Yeah. But as you grow and as the culture kind of shifts and changes, how have you been intentional about setting culture and setting your values? Um, that's a great question. I'm actually glad you asked it. So here's the thing. If you uh, ever get a chance, and you have, uh, to start a business, to start a company, you get to start with this clean sheet of paper and decide if you're intentional, like, what, what do I want to do here? Like, what are my objectives in building this company? And uh, as I mentioned, I'd worked at Aquantive, uh, like, end to end, it was about 10 years. And it was uh, an amazing experience in a million ways. Um, but one of the marquee uh, aspects of that is it was a phenomenal culture. And we would go to, I would go to these uh, Aquantive alumni events, and people would say, you know, oh, what are you doing now? And people and would say, the here's good old what I'm days. doing. Exactly. They miss yeah. the good old days. And, and uh, you know, man, it was, it's, you know, it's a good job, but it's no Aquantive, right? Yeah. It's no. And so when, when, when we started Flex, I mean, I, you know, one of the things I wrote down was, I want to build a company where people will say, there's no flex. Yeah. It's the best company I ever worked for. Yeah. And so, okay, great. That's an aspiration. So we were very intentional about that. And we're like, okay, so how are we going to do that? And so early on, we said, look, we should start to define our culture. We get to shape it. You know, like culture is going to happen. Like the only difference is, are we going to be intentional and try and shape it? Or is it just going to sort of sneak up on us and, and happen and, and, and be organic? And we wanted to try and shape and, and, and shape it and be intentional. So we initially created these hiring attributes, um, which uh, which were effective because you know you sit around an early early company, even a mature company, and you're like, well, what do we want to interview for? Well, they Curiosity. need to be good at their job. Yeah. They need to be good at their job. Like, yeah. are they a good developer? But then we want to, we want to, we want a good fit. You're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's define what good fit means to us. And it's it goes back to those tenets. If we can define what we mean by that and then share that out so everybody's on the same page. Then you can operationalize it. So mm -hmm. we would literally say, okay, um, who's going to ask questions? You know, if this cultural attribute um, of passion, that's a hard one, right? What does passion mean? What do we mean by that? Well, we define that. And then in every interview loop, someone would have their, that attribute their versus, their, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, the teamwork attribute. And you, you could set a, you know, be thoughtful about questions that you would ask. Did you have those as prescriptive, already pre-planned, or just like, hey, if I feel like asking about teamwork, I may have a different question. Exactly, than you might we have. let that. You know, we would define kind of here's what we mean by teamwork, and we can agree on what what we what we value in that, what we mean by that. But then, you know, like come up with your own questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is value in coming up with questions that you then ask consistently across candidates, so you can you can sort of gauge the different responses and start to tune into, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's a what's a um, a thoughtful answer that you think reflects well into what we're trying to get done. Yeah. Um, versus not. And were you so, thinking about the the equivalent of like a V2 hire? You know, like, hey, how do I hire? Maybe this person's great for now. We just need plug and play. Yep. But this person will not be able to lead a team. It's, it's, that's a great question too. It's hard. Uh, and it, it, the answer is it depended on the role. Mm -hmm. We very early on hired a handful of people explicitly because we felt like they would be able to scale. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it was pretty obvious because they had had a more senior role in starting mm -hmm. a smaller company. You know, it would be less scope in some ways. And in some cases, it was more of a bet. Yeah. Like, hey, we think this person could come in and, and crush the current job. And there's a bet that, that this is the person who could... Could lead others. Could lead uh, and, and continue to grow as the business grows. Yeah. And how did you ensure that there was not kind of a subconscious cultural bias happening, which people talk a lot about the word fit. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of criticism around it right yeah. now. Well, I think, it, again, it starts with defining what we mean by fit. Like, here are the cultural attributes and then trying to operationalize it, which we did pretty well. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, could have done better and it's yeah. not done, right? Um, How often do you revisit those? So uh, from those hiring attributes, you know, a year goes by and we're like, we should have we should have, um, we should define our cultural values. And we're like, yeah, we should do that. And then someone said, hey, didn't we already do that? Isn't, aren't those our hiring attributes? Like, literally, this is how the conversation went. And we kind of looked at them. We're like, yeah, you're right. We already have them. 
So we adopted those as our, you know, our company values. And that was probably t three years ago. Mm -hmm. We incorporated those into our performance review process to try and make them actionable and real. And again, I'd give us, you know, maybe a B minus on that. It's um, hard. It's challenging. It's challenging. Mm -hmm. But we are, uh, it's funny you should ask, right now, today, like this quarter, uh, one of our big projects is we are refining, revisiting and refining our company values. Mm -hmm. uh, in and, fact, and... there's a meeting going on right now oh. that I'm missing. Well, thank you for okay, being here. Which is okay. Hopefully they can just give you the, the right net net. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And they can sum it up for you. And so what, what today is kind of keeping you up at night? Like, what are you losing sleep over as the CEO? You know... Uh, hiring is always challenging. Um, we've we've hit a point in our life right now where we've had good momentum, kind of on a, on a lot of dimensions. You know, we raised uh, a round of capital, which is always helpful. Um, the business has been performing really, really well. There's kind of some buzz out there oh, yeah. for a variety Ernst of reasons. Ernst Young is really yeah. exciting. Yeah, so so momentum helps a lot with hiring. Mm -hmm. um, I also appreciate that that you know. You don't get to keep momentum forever, yeah. you know. Um, and then the other thing that's been very helpful is we've added a couple of um, super qualified, like world-class execs to our team. And they are talent magnets as well. So it kind of amplified oh, of our reach. Of course. Um, so hiring, I, it still keeps me up at night. Like um, we're, we're doing well, but we are still behind our hiring plan for the year. Mm -hmm. Um I'd say generally what keeps me up most is just as much success as we've had and as fast as we're growing, we're just not growing fast enough. You know, the opportunity is so big. Yeah, well, so so shifting because you're up at night and you talked about being with your wife for so many years. How is her role in all of this? And I know you've got three girls. Um, how are you finding time to kind of balance it all? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, uh, you know, my pie chart uh, uh, is sort of like job family, friends, and... Music, where's music? Yeah. Outdoors? Not, yeah. No, so, not so, so much. So it's kind of like, you know, what are the what are the things, uh, you know, if you have to make trade-offs, where do you make them? And for me, it's, it's family, then job. Uh, I have great friends, you know, don't see them as much as I'd like to. Um, generally speaking, they're kind of in the same world I am in, so... Mm -hmm. Everybody's busy, busy. Yeah. coming Everybody's up for busy. air. Uh, and then, you know, I wouldn't put it on the same level, but, you know, for me, exercise is sort of a key to... And what do you do to uh, stay... Uh, all sorts of, all sorts of different things. And you then, know, the and things then I end you... up giving up are, are uh, you know, as much time as I'd like to spend with friends. Sure. Um, maybe, you know, we don't get outdoors as much as we would like to, so you sort of make these these trade-offs along the way, but, but ultimately assess, you know, are those still the trade-offs I want to be making? For me... Absolutely. Like family is first. It will always be. But my, if I didn't have flex and not just any company, by the way, like flex, yeah, like it is what, it is what, uh, it is, is what fuels me. Oh, uh, yay. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice, <laughs> almost close. I'm not going to yeah. let you leave yet. We have a couple more minutes because I need to know you a little bit more. I'm more curious. I've read a lot and you have some awesome things out there. I didn't want to repeat them in case people are researching you. Um, but you talked a lot about how you like to continue to learn and continue to grow. Are you kind of intentional about that? Are you always seeking out um, people you can learn from or books you can learn from? Yeah, I'm always always uh, reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and I typically will read like one um, kind of business sort of book, uh, more or less, or uh, something that's more of a learning book. Um, I've always got one of those going. So mm -hmm. super intentional there. And, uh, and then... And then, you know, learning, the, my other source of learning is the people I work with. Yeah. You know, it, it, we have been fortunate enough to hire some amazing people and they bring not only uh, different uh, talents, but different experiences and different perspectives. Um, and uh, as I said kind of earlier, I think having those different perspectives, you know, diversity is just critical. Well, it's nice also that you're the kind of person who's A, open to it. And that you seem like you're the type of leader who le is um, really good at leading, but also okay following and being a little vulnerable about what you might not know and being like, it doesn't matter. We just need to get to the end. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's huge. Like one of the benefits of being uh, 
a more experienced. If I to say older. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that. Develop, develop and so a I, read, I read these two books that you recommended. One is the Checklist Manifesto. The other one is the Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah. Um, why those two? What give me so that I don't have to read them? Just the net net. I know I've I've read a lot about the hard things, the hard thing about hard things. Yeah. So the Checklist Manifesto says this guy Atul Gawande, who's this like unbelievably accomplished doctor, teacher. Um, you know, there's this uh, health company that was trying, I don't know what the status is, but um, Bezos and Buffett and Jamie Dimon were creating this health oh, entity. yeah, right? yeah. You know, the person they mm -hmm. picked to put in charge of that was this, this guy. guy. So it, and he's just amazing. He's a father and he's written a bunch of books and, and just absolutely brilliant in probably any way you could define it. And he writes this book about the importance of having a checklist. You know, in a world where, you know, people have such deep, skills and experience you know i'm a surgeon like i you know i know you know just because i've done thousands of these i know what to do in the moment when there's the aneurysm or the whatever or i'm a software engineer and i know or i'm a pilot with tens of thousands of hours of experience like i know like experience matters and and that is all true but you know he writes this book it's like yeah and checklists are important too like, that's why pilots actually open up the book and they go down the list and they're like, did I flip on this switch and did I mm -hmm. turn on this light and did I check the blower and did I, you know, it's sort of this uh, check, it, it, check on hubris a little bit. Uh, so that's one. Of, it's like that's keeping why they, me humble? A little bit. And, and it's just like, let's not get, yeah. Is that your Midwest parents? Maybe. But, but, but honestly, the other thing is like. Uh, I'm not the most detail-oriented person in the world. My team's probably chuckling if they ever listen to yeah, this. Yeah, my, but, my but like, team's chuckling I, alongside I, you. I, um, but I know that, and so it's in, super important that we have people on our team who are. Yes, checklist uh, and types. And do. Yeah. Um, and they're wired that way, and that helps us be more effective. So that's yeah. that's that one. The hard thing about hard things is just, it's a, it's a great book by Ben Horowitz. It's about starting a company. Yeah. It's probably one that uh, more people have read, but... Last two questions. Um, how are you as a parent as opposed to how are you as a leader of a company? Or is it the same guy? In many ways, it's the same guy. I think... Um, like, what would your kids say? What word would your kids use to describe you? They would say, mom makes all the tough decisions and says no, and dad, you know, is sort of more tolerant. Um, which isn't necessarily the same way as at work. It might just be that, you know, like when I'm done with work, I'm kind of ready to chill, not be the decider yeah. uh, at some level. Um, I think that's part of it. I think that sometimes when I'm easy on the kids, it's because I have guilt. Mm. You know, I'm making up for like, oh, I wasn't yeah. there. I feel bad. I mean, there could be a little you know, bit of that. Where you're like, I'm going to do travel. Dad. I do travel, but my wife works. I mean, she's got the hardest job because she works half, quote, quote unquote, half time or 60 percent. That's you know, even worse. And <laughs> and is the primary by far the primary. I love um, how you speak about her. And and when you were at the Ernst & Young accepting the award, I loved it. You were just um, I felt like I knew you better after that. It was really cool. I'm glad that you won. And I think that you're on to like huge things. So the ultimate what fuels you is flex. And in your life. Legacy-wise, what fuels you? You know, I, uh, legacy-wise, I mean, I, I, I guess two things. One, I'll come back to what I said earlier. I, I would love to be able to build a company where people at some point down the road would say, that's the best company I ever worked for. You know, company-related legacy, uh, you know, I just, the, this business is sort of inevitable. And, you know, it's, it's ours to build. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can look back on it and say, yep, that was us that, that created this better way to do something that's really, really important uh, in the sense that, you know, look, we're not curing cancer, but it's really important in the sense of the magnitude. But in and the macro scope. level of just of just the economy, too. Exactly. Exactly. And then, the you know, the other thing is I hope, uh, you know, the other legacy, you know, is, is often realized through kids. So I hope my kids are, are good people. I hope my kids are, um, you know, contribute. Uh, in meaningful ways, and and that's the other part of the legacy that, that matters to me. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the podcast. My so pleasure. fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com. 
to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.